Hello, everyone. I'm Evo Dalder, President of the Chicago Council on Global Affairs, and this is World Review, our weekly roundup of news from around the world. This week, the fallout um, from Afghanistan. Uh, joining us uh, today from New York City, Carla Robbins, formerly of the Wall Street Journal, New York Times, now an adjunct fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations. And Evo. also from, hi, Carla, great to see you. Also from New York, Bobby Gosh, opinion editor at Bloomberg Opinion. Bobby, great to see you. Likewise, I'm, I'm back in London, just in case. Oh, you're back in London. Okay, right. very good. Excellent. Uh, I know you're, you're, you're going back and forth between the two. And Steve Erlanger, I know he's in Brussels because we've seen the background before. <laughs> Steve Erlanger, uh, diplomatic, uh, chief diplomatic correspondent in Europe for the New York Times. This has been a hard week. It's been a hard month uh, for all of us in one form or another. Uh, yesterday, uh, 100 plus people killed by a suicide bomber just outside uh, the Kabul airport gates, including 13 American servicemen, uh, Marines, sailor, and I believe a soldier as well. Uh, really a tragic circumstances, but really a tragic situation. 20 years of investment. Uh, uh, by the United States, uh, its NATO allies, and many others, including in particular many people in Afghanistan, uh, is now uh, hanging in the balance uh, almost literally. Uh, Carla, let's start with you, uh, because um, when you think about uh, the way in which we have been involved for so long, the way we knew what was happening in this country, the intelligence and military and diplomatic resources that we have devoted uh, to Afghanistan. How do you explain the chaotic way, and I think that's a nice uh, phrase, uh, uh, of the last uh, few, few months in terms of the evacuation and the withdrawal uh, from Afghanistan? We'll leave for his history the question whether that decision was the right decision. But once you make the decision to withdraw, how uh, did we end up where we saw a suicide bomber killing more American servicemen uh, than uh, any time since 2011 in, in, in one go? How did that happen? You know, it's the question that I've been asking and we've all been asking day after day after day since this started, you know. It's you know, Biden has to own this, you know, and, and when he made the decision to pull out based on a date rather than conditions on the ground, everyone knew the outcome. The only question was how fast the place was going to unravel and did they have a plan to get Americans and Afghan allies out in an orderly manner and a reasonably safe manner if it went faster than they were predicting. And we now know they wildly overestimated how long they had. And while it was always going to be painful and ugly, there was no way to describe this, but a massive and tragic mess. And we know these folks, you know, this is not the Trump crowd of neophytes and charlatans, which makes it all the more infuriating and depressing. So who's to blame, which is what you're asking, and where did the process break down? I mean, how did smart people blow this withdrawal so badly? And let's stipulate, this is a hard thing to do. It's a very hard place to work. Um, Biden has to take a big part of the rap. You know, presidents, of course, always do, but this really is his policy from start to finish. This is certainly not what the military or the intelligence community wanted. Biden is a famously stubborn man, and his determination to get out no matter what, dating back a decade or more, shaped every tactical decision along the way. And I would argue almost certainly made his entire team less willing to plan for the worst case, especially if it meant staying longer or sending troops back in, something they ended up having to do anyway. So when the intel folks came back in the last weeks before the drawdown and said, sorry, I know we said, you know, we had 18 months, but it turns out it could be 30 to 60 days. They didn't slow the train down. The intel folks aren't off the hook, of course. I mean, where did they one to two year estimate come from in the first place? I am by no means an Afghanistan expert, but everybody knew the Afghanistan military's dependence on the U.S. from everything from air support to contractors to keep their own planes flying, as well as the psychological blow of a U.S. retreat. Where did that number come from? Austin, you know, Secretary of Defense and his team have to bear huge responsibility, too, for either proposing or agreeing to a plan that prioritized getting the military out before civilians. What were they thinking with that? And shutting down Bagram, the other air, the air base in early July, which means they had only one place to fly out, you know, for the Kabul airport. And once they made that decision, why didn't they have a better plan to police the area around the airport instead of relying on, as Biden explained, the self-interest 
or even the competence of the Taliban. You know, Biden ran on competence, especially in foreign affairs. And this has hugely damaged that claim. And it really keeps coming back to the fact that he wanted out. And if you really, really want out, you don't plan for the worst case. And so, you know, competence gets trumped by stubbornness here. And he personally is going to play, you know, pay a huge price for it politically, I suspect. Now, the country wants out of Afghanistan, and they may forget but right now, you know, we are all hurting terribly for it, and Afghanistan's going to pay the highest price for years and years to come. Uh, thanks, Carla. I think that that that, that hits a lot of the uh, uh, the, the right uh, um, tone and and, uh, and and elements of this. Uh, we'll get to what will happen to Afghanistan in a minute. But Bobby, uh, uh, talk a little bit about some of those assumptions that were undergirding. It seems to, uh, uh, as Carla put. Uh, the, the withdrawal, this idea that that you know best case planning should uh, displace worst case planning in a situation that, by God, Biden and his team thought was the worst place, uh, uh, which is why they were trying to get out in the first place. Yeah, I, I think Carla summed it up masterfully. The only other data point I would add to this that uh, other mistake was the timing of it to to make the announcement at the start of the annual fighting season rather than to the end of it. If this happens in November, December, the fact that this fighting season is over alone uh, gives the US a little more time, a little more breathing space. Maybe not a whole lot, but a little more. Um, we've been in that country for 20 years and we still haven't learned the rhythm of the fighting season in Afghanistan. That is preposterous. Um, I think now we, we're, and in the last 24 hours, we've been hearing both from the president and others in the administration about how all of this is predicated on the Taliban enabling a smooth withdrawal. And this idea that there, there's a mutual interest with the Taliban, that the Taliban want us to exit smoothly and quickly. Um, these are very dangerous assumptions to make. The, they start from the assumption that the Taliban is somehow one monolithic organization. And if you get the leadership to see sense, um, everybody else will fall uh, in behind the leadership. That's patently not the case. The Taliban is a mix of all kinds of groups. And some of those groups don't really want to see necessarily the United States leave in an orderly manner. They would like us to leave with blood on our, our shirts and carrying our dead and wounded with us. That would please them very much. That would cheer them. And this may or may not come from the top of the leadership, but at the, at the foot soldier level, the difference between a Taliban fighter and an ISIS fighter, not a whole lot. Remember that the ISIS in, in Afghanistan recruited from the Taliban. A lot of those foot soldiers are actual brothers, never mind former brothers at arms. And all it takes, really, all it takes in a situation as volatile as this is one or two foot soldiers at a checkpoint outside the airport looking the other way when an ISIS suicide bomber comes through. And what and you can from there, there's carnage and chaos and humiliation and disgrace. So these idea, this this presumption that somehow the Taliban would help us leave in an organized manner is a terrible, terribly delusional thing to do. And now we're suggesting that after we've left that the Taliban will somehow help us keep ISIS uh, locked in a box because they have, uh, that they hate each other. Again, the hatred for each other is fairly fungible. We've seen this before in Afghanistan when an extremist group comes and takes over in Kabul, they know how to make compromises, sometimes very short-term compromises, but they know how to make compromises with groups with whom they've been fighting for years and years. Um, so these are not safe assumptions. And I, and I fear, I want to start this conversation on, on, a, on a sort of uh, negative note, but I fear that there's worse to come, that, that, that what we saw yesterday may not even be the, the bloodiest uh, uh, event of this departure. Sometimes the enemy of my enemy is my enemy. Uh, and, uh, and we tend to forget that uh, uh, when we deal with this as really complex uh, and chaotic a situation as this. But, but Steve, as, as you look at it for a little bit from a distance, uh, you, you of course used to report from Washington DC and, and, and do all the intricacies what, what strikes you as sort of the underlying problem here uh, that, that led to this situation? Was it inevitable? 
that we were in going to be in once you decide to leave it's going to be something like this is going to happen lots of people wanting to get out more people wanting to get out than you possibly could get on a on a set of airplanes or or, or really was it uh, deliberate uh, policy mistakes uh, and, and decisions that led to this how do how do you look at it well i think it was a lot of analytical mistakes i mean the intelligence was there basically intelligence is a bunch of options but I think as Carla and Bobby quite rightly said, when the boss wants to go, everybody tries to make that happen as best as possible without, I think, understanding a couple of things. You know, one obviously is, is the psychological impact of Big Brother leaving. And we've seen collapses before. I mean, I saw, I wasn't, there, but I was nearby, uh, the Khmer Rouge collapse. When, when the Vietnamese came in, they thought they would just come in and take a little territory and start a civil insurrection and the whole regime collapsed. Um, this, this can happen. Um, and secondly, I think, you know, we got very confused. Um, this is what I think between what we thought was the war on terrorism and democracy building and, and, and nation building, and promotion of values and trying to remake a society that frankly didn't much want to be remade except perhaps in the big cities. Um, so I think that makes the pain worse, particularly for NGOs, for women's rights activists. Um, it, it feels like a tremendous blow to their assumptions of what is good in the world and, and, and of aspirations. So I think that's extremely painful. And the other thing I don't think they quite understood is when you tell the Pentagon to do something, it may do it, sometimes grumpily, but when you tell them to leave, they leave quickly. Force protection is everything. They're not gonna hang around, right? So I, I don't know how much the Bagram disaster was approved in the White House, but it didn't surprise me at all. They took everything out, they shut off the lights, they didn't even say goodbye because they were afraid someone might attack them and off, off they went. So, you know, now we find ourselves, you know, it's, it's not easy, it's heartbreaking. I don't think there's a very good way to protect an airport in the middle of an enemy regime. I mean, it's so bizarre anyway to think that the Taliban, which has just taken over this country, much to its own surprise, has allowed this evacuation to go on as long as it has. I mean, some of its best people are leaving. And, and I'm surprised that they haven't, pre you know, prevented it themselves, prevented Afghans from, from leaving. So, you know, I hope it all goes smoothly for the rest of NATO allies. It's been a sad tale. We can talk about that later um, of, of um, what ambitions are and what responsibilities are. But there's no question this falls on this administration. It's not enough to say that Trump signed the exit deal, which he pretended was a peace treaty in February 2020, because the Taliban didn't keep to its end of the deal. So if Biden had wanted to say, you're not following your end, I'm not following my end, that could have been done. And the presumption that Biden always makes um, that that would have meant a big reinsertion of American forces, well, that's not clear. Oh, there are a lot of smart people who think that's probably not true. We can debate the the wisdom of the original decision, and and I think we 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 will, and you know I have my own views on on that uh, as we go along. But um, uh, and we'll get back to the NATO issue and and et cetera in in a minute. But let me let me switch Bobby to to sort of okay, what now? Yeah, and and particularly what now in Afghanistan and, and the region? Uh, there there you know the Taliban took over, and Steve I think rightly said much to its own surprise. Uh, uh, as quickly as it did, it's now in control of a country, but is it in control of the country? And how long is that going to be? This is a country that has been fighting for power in one form or another since what, 1976? 
um, uh, in, in my, uh, since the the the, the uh, deposing of the former king, um, uh, a time actually of some interesting stability in in that part of the world, um, uh, and, and and some and, and some real progress as well. I mean, uh, in the fifties and the sixties, Afghanistan was was a hopeful place, uh, but it hasn't been for a very long time. And the idea that somehow now a bunch of Taliban fighters who've been sitting in Pakistan uh, from the leadership and or, and or been fighting in the in the rural areas of Pakistan for the last 20 years are going to be able to run a far different country than they left when they were uh, thrown out of power in 2001 uh, is, is going to be interesting. So how do you see the future of Afghanistan and sort of the region, Pakistan, Iran, uh, China, India, uh, and of course, uh, uh, Central Asia writ large? Yeah, it's uh, thank you for making that point. It's it's worth it's worth making. People often forget, and indeed the president forgot uh, yesterday when he said, "Well, these people have always been fighting. It's always been unstable. They've not been a, a proper country uh, forever." That's not technically true. That's not factually true. For most of the 20th century, Afghanistan was actually the safest, calmest, uh, uh, most stable place in the whole of that region. Compared with India, compared with Pakistan, the 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 Soviet uh, states, compared with Iran until 1976, until the superpowers of the world got involved in Afghanistan's business. Afghanistan was coming along slowly, imperfectly, but peacefully. Um, what goes, what now going forward for Afghanistan and the region around it? Well, for me, so you're absolutely right. The Taliban simply doesn't have the skill set to run a country. You know, it's one thing to raise a billion dollars a year, that's the calculation that they were raising, mostly from drug smuggling, to fight an insurgency. It's quite another thing to run a $22 billion economy, to manage a budget of six or seven billion dollars a year, even, as, even assuming that the, the donors and, and lenders who were previously willing to give you the money will continue to feel that way. So there's a huge skills gap. They don't simply, they've just announced a central bank governor. No one's ever heard of him. Turns out his main experience of the job was extortion in the, in the districts that Afghanistan used to, uh, beg your pardon, that the Taliban used to run in Afghanistan. That's, that gives you a sense of the problem. They don't have people who know how to run a country. Elementary things. Now, the, the follow-up question that is, who's going to help them? The two most likely candidates for that, Pakistan, old friends, and we know how that movie goes. It does not usually go very well. And then you have a potentially new player, which is Qatar, which helped uh, make the peace deal or uh, uh, surrender, or whatever the right expression is that, that uh, Trump signed in Doha last year. Uh, Qatar is, try is presenting itself as the new Taliban whisperers, if you like. Mm. Uh, does that work? Can Qatar help? In theory, yes, they have deep pockets. They can provide funding. Um, they seem to have the, the support of at least the political faction of the Taliban, but we don't really know whether the military faction, far more powerful, far more dangerous, and, and, and far more uh, retrogressive in their views, how they feel about it. I think what you'll see first and foremost is a, is a rivalry between Pakistan and Qatar for influence in Kabul. The Pakistanis will fight hard and potentially fight dirty. For, for, for the Qataris, having a friendly government in Kabul is a good geopolitical outcome. For the Pakistanis, it's existentially important to have a, a friendly government, uh, a pliable government in Kabul. So how the Taliban runs Afghanistan to, to a substantial degree will depend on who they turn to for help in that purpose. Around them, the in, again, that will also have a, the, the Indians would be much happier if the Qataris were, were mentoring the Taliban rather than Pakistan for the obvious reasons. I think everybody would be would prefer to have the Qataris play that role uh, because that the Qataris at least know how to speak the language of global commerce or trade and and people might be able to donors and, and aid agencies and, and NGOs might be able to trust Qatar to intercede on their behalf. If it's Pakistan that's playing the role, I think all bets are off and the entire neighborhood will feel obviously with the exception of the Pakistanis, will feel very nervous about how to deal with these set of people who've turned up now in Kabul and don't speak literally and metaphorically the international language. Arla, uh, 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 you know, as this sort of plays out, uh, both the Taliban starting to learn about what it means to have a central bank and how to run it, uh, the, the 
the, the, the competition inevitably between, as, as Bobby says, Qatar, Pakistan, and those who are affiliated with them. And of course, Qatar has, uh, has competition in its own region with the Saudis and the UAE who make them support the Pakistanis. It could, can all get very interesting. Uh, it means that the area itself um, uh, is fruitful territory for those who wish others ill uh, to come back in, which is, as we remember, why we got into this thing in the first place. Uh, uh, 20 years ago, the 9-11 attacks uh, and the need to sure, make sure Afghanistan is no longer a safe haven for terrorism. How worried are you? How worried should we be that on that essential mission, which as Biden again said yesterday, was mission accomplished, uh, uh, that that may now uh, unravel as well and, and Afghanistan becomes again a territorial safe place for people who are willing to uh, use terror as a means for political uh, political political gain. Yesterday, of course, was the worst day to say that mission was accomplished, um, and uh, and and the tragedy the tragedy of it. Um, you know, the Biden administration. Part of the argument, Biden's argument, was that you know said that the threat was no longer as dire. That there were you know terrorist threats coming, much more serious terrorist threats coming out of Africa, which was the argument that the you know, Avril Haines, the director of national intelligence, was originally making. All of which is true. I mean, there's terrorism is coming from lots of different places around the world. But what we saw yesterday is that there is terrorism in Afghanistan. And as Bobby said, um, you know, the Taliban's not in control um, and there's no guarantee they're going to be in control. This could very well be a, quote, failed state and and which is you know, a great place for terrorism to thrive. And the other argument that the administration made, once again, I believe, you know, sort of post-dating their argument because they wanted a, a reason to get out, is that you, the U.S. defense and intelligence apparatus was at the point where they could suppress any terrorist threat with over-the-horizon capabilities. Um, you know, I think they're rethinking that even as we speak after yesterday's experience. I think they were rethinking that before yesterday's experience. And they're trying to figure out whether they can get bases closer to you know, Afghanistan. It takes a really long time to fly if you're going to fly from Qatar or if you're going to fly from Kuwait. You don't have a lot of time hovering over targets looking for, you know, look, looking for people to take out. You go back to what was the problem at the time of the Clinton administration. You start looking for people and they're already gone um, by the time you get there. And so you know, I think the lesson of what, of what yesterday was is that the, no place is, you know, Terrorists come from lots of different places. Al-Shabaab is scary. I mean, there's lots of different places that are scary, but Afghanistan's scary too. And if the Taliban doesn't take full control, which is something that certainly we don't want from a political point of view and from a human rights point of view, it's going to be even more terrifying because you're going to have it as, once again, a witch's brew of different terrorist groups. You know, So yes, I think they're going to have to make really basic decisions from a counterterrorism point of view at the very time when they were arguing, let's get out so we can pivot back to thinking about Russia and China and all the other things that we know, you know, that we really, really care about. You know, Panetta said yesterday, we're going to have to go back in. Um, you know, whether we're going to have to go back in massively with many troops. But what did Biden say yesterday? He warned ISIS, ISIS-K, we're going to track you down. Well, how are we going to track them down? They're going to need some sort of basing and capability to do that. So you know, the notion that we don't need the bases in Afghanistan, I think he's already seeing the fact that that's probably not true. Uh, Steve, I want to talk about two other neighbors uh, uh, who, who are looking very closely at what has happened. And in some ways... Uh, have mixed feelings, Russia and China, uh, in the sense that, you know, on the one hand, it's good for the United States to get a bloody nose, and, and this was pretty bloody. Uh, on the other hand, who's going to take responsibility and what's going to happen to this area for their interests? How do you think they are, are, are looking at this issue? There's a lot of nervousness among the neighbors, I have to say. Um, China wants a stable Afghanistan, basically, right? And it was stable when the Americans were there. They didn't really like the Americans there, but it was okay. Um, uh, failed state is not what interests China. They do have a small border with Afghanistan. In the past, when the Taliban ran Afghanistan, there were uh, 
Uyghur issues uh, inside Afghanistan that attacked China. Uh, Pakistan, you know, has its problems too. The, is, the Pakistani Taliban is no friend of the, of the actual Pakistan government. Um, and it's quite extraordinary in the world. I think we've all seen it, how cat's paws turn around and eat the cat. This can happen. Um, and so Pakistan has reason to be nervous. Uzbekistan had, you know, bombs go off. Tajikistan had bombs go off when the Taliban was in power last time from groups, you know, Islamic radical groups, Islamist radical groups who had, if not support inside Afghanistan, had uh, places to hide there. So I think, you, you know, this is going to be a problem. Um, Russia, I think, you, you know, Russia's biggest worry, I think, is drugs, because the drugs that come out of Afghanistan, it's Iran's worry too. Iran is a huge drug problem that it never likes to talk about. But most of the hard drugs that come into Russia come that way. Um, so I, I think there are real issues there too. No, I mean, it's, it's a destabilized, you know, it, there's a reason why big powers and colonial powers tried to control Afghanistan in the past. Those reasons are geographic and they're real and they continue to exist. Um, so, you know, frankly, I think quite a lot of people, as, as others have said, if the Taliban can actually control the place and begin to understand that, you know, the world has moved on a bit, then I think people will be happier. But as others, you know, Bobby and Carla both pointed out, the guys with the guns have a lot more power than the guys who sat in five-star hotels inside Doha. And they're angrier and they've lost brothers and fathers and sisters and, 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 and um, wedding parties. And it's a new generation. They don't even remember the last time. Um, so there's a lot we simply don't know. One thing we do know is that in propaganda terms, uh, this has been a huge victory for Islamist radicalism all over the world. This is the great Satan that Ob Osama bin Laden wanted to attack, which has been humbled and driven out by people who look like fourth century herders with guns. Can we just uh, add but, one, one yeah, other thing, Eva, yeah, which please. is, you know, there was this UN report that came out and I, I mean, I don't know, you know, Intel is such a squishy thing. Um, but there was a UN report saying that there are jihadi fighters already moving out of Central Asia into Afghanistan. Um, and, you know, that itself, you know, are we going to rely, as Bobby was saying before, on the Taliban to fight these people? Or, you know, that's a very a big thing. And then do we rely on all of our other allies. I mean, is it in the Chinese interest and the Russian interest to join together as they did with the United States to try, you know, once again to join the counterterrorism mission? Or is the world so much more fragmented now that everybody's going to stay back and let this place collapse and as it once again radiates, you know, massive terrorism all over the world? I, I want to get back, to, uh, 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 turn next to, to, to sort of the implication of the United States and its allies. But before I do, and uh, Bobby, uh, is, is there, is there a, a, a good case scenario? Is there anything where we say maybe, is there something that the international community can do to strengthen the good, the good forces within the Taliban in order to help them take control of the country vis-a-vis um, uh, -vis, uh, the bad guys, uh, whether, the, you know, the political, let, let's call them the political Taliban as opposed to the military Taliban. There's this uh, beginnings of an urgency to say, you know, the situation is so bad, why don't we work with this Taliban to see if we can find a way to stabilize the situation uh, or, or is that just a hopeless, uh, a hopeless cause? Well, you know, there are bad, bad outcomes, terrible outcomes and, and, and less bad outcomes. And I think in the third category, I would say, you know, the, the people who, who are now giving the press conferences, Mullah Barada and the political faction that was involved in the negotiations in Doha, they might represent the least bad outcome. The trouble is, and, and we might 
if we squint very very hard we might just see the 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 the, the poss slim possibility that a, a something like a recognizable responsible government uh, is possible in, in with that faction in charge the trouble with that is that we have no control over the internal dynamics of the Taliban. And it's not clear that that faction is the dominant one. It may be the one in front of the cameras right now, but we don't know that that is the dominant faction. This, we know from our previous experiences that decisions made in Kabul can, will, and often are overruled in Kandahar, where the Shura, the council of the Taliban, uh, uh, resides. Um, we, we, we basically have no option but to wait until the internal dynamics of the Taliban work themselves out. Um, and I think international agencies, governments, donors, investors, what have you, will all really realistically have to wait for that outcome. Um, if the militant faction uh, proves to be dominant, all bets are off. If the political faction is dominant, then maybe, just maybe, um, through the good offices of intermediaries, Qatar, the Turks, um, it might be possible to do business, uh, at least rudimentary business, with the Taliban, and then slowly over a period of years, uh, see if we can hold them to the promises they made when they arrived in, in Kabul at the start of last week. But there are too many ifs in that, in that uh, uh, sort of best case scenario. And... I'm a journalist by profession. I'm a professional cynic. I, I can't find myself sort of going down beyond the first if, never mind the second, third, and fourth. Yeah, and it's a it's a very thin thread uh, that that holds yeah. uh, those ifs together. But uh, thanks for giving us slight a slight degree of potential hope in a truly hopeless situation. Um, uh, uh, Steve, uh, the, the the reaction of our allies, who it is well to remember after 9-11 invoked for the first and only time the collective security uh, guarantee of Article 5 and have been with us on the ground for all of those 20 years uh, uh, to what has happened uh, in the last few weeks, months, really has been uh, uh, pretty astonishing and pretty hard. Um, uh, I, I can't find anybody who is supportive. Uh, of what has happened, maybe maybe in your reporting you have been able to find uh, someone, uh, but some of the the rhetoric and, and language that we've heard is is uh, uh, is new, particularly after the Biden is back, America is back kind of sense that things were going well. Uh, you've reported on this. Uh, how should we look at what the European reaction is? What has the European reaction be and been, and 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 how should we look at it? How serious should we take it? And what's the long-term consequence for the relationship between the United States and its allies? I think NATO is hugely embarrassed and humiliated by what's happened, not just because of what the United States decided to do, but how NATO behaved when the United States decided to do it. I mean, it's a... You know, it was always America's war. I mean, the Europeans didn't care about Afghanistan, honestly. They didn't have really interest there. They went along to support us, right? So when the U.S. decided to leave, they were going to leave. I mean, it's, I mean, the British talking about, oh, we wanted to arrange something else. It's, it's really a, a lot of nonsense because I've talked to people inside NATO. It was never real. The Turks were always interested in staying, which they still are for all kinds of you know, reasons that make sense. Um, but no one, you know, the French pulled out seven years ago. I mean, they haven't been, I mean, they gave up on Afghanistan, you know, they kept doing aid, but, you know, I, I think we gave up on winning the war in 2010, frankly. And since then, it's been an inevitable process of when, how do you keep it going? Can you keep it going? When will the Americans finally decide to pull out? So what struck me was how little noise we heard in February 2020, when Trump signed this absurd deal, which really was, you know, a, not a surrender, but which let five, 6,000 criminals out of jail, including a bunch of terrorists, which didn't involve the Afghanistan government, 
you know, which was a way of getting America out. And NATO said nothing then, nor did NATO have its own evacuation plan. They thought they'd just leave it up to the Americans. I mean, the NATO people were on vacation this summer. I mean, they didn't see it coming any more than anyone else did. The Dutch, I know, what was their evacuation plan? It, it was commercial airlines. That, that's how most people thought they would get their people out. So there's a lot of embarrassment. And when people are embarrassed, they get angry and they talk loudly and they talk about how abused they've been. So we've heard a fair amount of that. Um, and it does raise the very serious question of whether um, Biden is in the end going to treat allies much differently than Trump. I mean, he'll, he's nicer to them. Now, some people, you know, like Robin Niblett at Chatham House smartly argue that there are bigger issues for the Europeans than Afghanistan. There's climate change, there's China, Russia. They'd rather have Biden than have Trump again. Right. So, you know, this will over time go away. And then you have other people talking about, you know, strategic autonomy and let's have a European, you know, capability. Well, we've heard that for 50 years. I'm sorry. I mean, you, you know, there was supposed to be the headline goal. The EU in the late 90s was going to have 60,000 troops ready to go. Well, it never happened, right? And there's capabilities inside NATO only the Americans have. Now, if the Europeans want to spend the money, which they don't, and they want to develop things like surveillance and air refueling and all kinds of things that only the Americans can do, then let's have a real European pillar in NATO. I think that would be great. But, you know, for the moment, I take this, you know, almost as a, as a, as a question of psychology and a certain degree of salt, salt for wounds. And, and, and the wounds are deep and they're real um, and they're gonna take a long time to heal. And I do think Biden's reputation, the reputation of his administration has been you know, badly damaged. Um, it may not be badly damaged over time domestically at home, but abroad there is, uh, if not, you know, if Trump wasn't a wake up call, this one is, that America's notion of its strategic interests are different and it has interests that go uh, well beyond Europe and European interests are not necessarily prime among them. Now, I don't think, if I can say this, I have no doubt about US commitment to Article 5 and collective defense and the defense of the Baltics. That doesn't, that's not an issue. The issue to me is America's commitments to non-treaty allies, which is basically what Afghanistan was. And there you have quite a lot of damage done. Carla, right, build on that last point. And in, in, in this, this, this credibility argument comes back all the time that the United States needs to do things in order to maintain its credibility. There's a wonderful passage in George Packer's biography of, of, of of Dick Holbrook, uh, uh, where he, uh, he he cites something out of Holbrook's diaries, a conversation Holbrook had with with Biden, partly about his son Bo, and I'm not going to have my son fight for women in Afghanistan, which is a pretty remarkable statement. Uh, but but also, you know, last time I looked, he said Nixon and Kissinger didn't really suffer politically uh, from the fact that, and nor did American foreign policy really get undermined by our defeat in Vietnam. Uh, and sort of this idea that the credibility of the United States is a little bigger than uh, walking away from a war we were losing and should have never been engaged in in the first place. How should we think about this? Is that, a, is, that a, is that the right interpretation? Or in fact, when you think about it from the other point of view, you hear the Europeans and others saying, wait a minute, we thought, we thought Trump was a one-off. And now, now we have Trump with a human face, but it doesn't seem to be very different. Uh, when, when it comes to uh, the credibility. How, how do you read it? And, and how worried should we be about it? Well, I, I'm with Steve. I mean, there's a lot of European crocodile tears on, you know, it's their sort of, you know, we weren't adequately consulted and we also weren't paying any attention. And there's was always the complaint from, from the Americans that, that, yeah, the Europeans were in Afghanistan and they weren't fighting because there were all these conditions on how they actually you know, played there. Now, there were Europeans who certainly died in countries who, who took it more seriously than others. 
But I think it's sort of the arrogance and the incompetence that more than anything else, and perhaps the incompetence of it that's the most damaging thing in the perception of it. And certainly, you know, Putin's national security advisor, you know, Petrushev, you know, was already spinning the tail. You know, he was, was telling the Ukrainians, sort of signaling the Ukrainians, you know, like, don't expect them to back you up. Look what they did to Afghanistan. And the, Chi you know, the Chinese were having great, can the Chinese have shot in Freud? I don't know how you say that in Chinese. I mean, there's certainly like out there, you know, spinning this. Um, and but this goes back not just with Biden, I mean, and not just with Trump. I mean, there was this feeling of retreat, Evo, you know this well, um, with Obama as well. So we live in a different world than the world of after Vietnam. Um, we live in a much more fragmented world um, in which many things, you know, they've got a rising China. If there's a, it's not a guaranteed American leadership world anymore. And yes, we have to tend our leadership. We have to we have to be more aware of it. And I think people, you know, the test for Biden was always not just Trump versus Biden, but whether, you know, whether Biden was just a one off in a long line issue here. I mean, the, it, and and I think this was this is a bad one. It's a bad mark for him. I don't think it's inevitably, you know, you know something he can't recover from. But I don't think the United States can take its credibility for granted, even if they hadn't blown it in Afghanistan. I think our credibility was on the line even before Afghanistan. And this is really a bad one. Bobby, you're back in London. Uh, if crocodile tears were shed, they were shed in, in, in buckets full uh, uh, in London. The reaction in the British press and, in the, and among British politicians, including Theresa May, uh, uh, and 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 the, the Secretary of Defense, um, uh, Defense Secretary, has been pretty remarkable. Um, in uh, how do you how do you read the mood in London? And and you know, as Philip Stevens wrote today, is it a lot of flailing and just showing the incompetence of of uh, and and impotence of of the UK, or is this real? And and does this have something to say about the future relationship between the UK and 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 the US? I, I think I think Philip was right. It is a lot of flailing about. It is a lot of excuse making, um, and and it is it's sort of it's it's a little hard to to take uh, British accusations of incompetence when we read about stories like the one in the Times today, in which the British uh, embassy, as it was in its haste to depart, left behind information about all the Afghans who worked for the embassy, for the Taliban to find and use to their own, for their own convenience at a time of their choosing. Um, so it's a little rich. Um, that old G7 sideshow in which Boris Johnson says to Biden, we'd like you to extend the deadline, was exactly that sideshow, a show. Um, I think the White House had made it clear well beforehand that that was not going to happen. And by the way, the Taliban had made it very clear well beforehand that that was not going to happen. It was a little opportunity for uh, Boris Johnson to do a little virtue signaling. Um, I don't think it's very much more than that. The British, much even less than the Europeans, uh, can't afford to um, antagonize the United States too much, especially after Brexit, especially after, uh, especially given the fact that they need access to the American economy. Uh, on good terms, um, much more than they ever have uh, in living memory. Uh, so yes, there will be a little bit of uh, sullenness and, uh, and the next time Biden comes through this part of the world, he will uh, have to stroke some egos, which as a consummate politician, he knows how to do, and then everybody will go back. And especially if, as Steve says, um, the administration can adroitly move on to all those other issues that the Europeans cared about, uh, Russia, China, the the, um, the climate. Um, I fear that they will forget Afghanistan very quickly. I think on that sad note, uh, we will have to end it. And, and it's probably a good note to end. Um, real lives are uh, being affected by decisions that are made in distant capitals. Uh, Afghanistan is a country that probably has suffered more than just about any other country in the world. It'd be hard to find uh, maybe to... D, uh, DRC in Africa or Yemen uh, are places that uh, that compete. Uh, a, a wonderful, beautiful country with a wonderful, beautiful people uh, is is suffering greatly, uh, as we have seen day in and day out on our television screens, and that's likely to continue. 
uh, no matter what happens. Uh, but I want to thank uh, Carla Robbins, uh, Steve Erlanger, Bobby Gosh for your insight uh, uh, and perspective on the fallout uh, of Afghanistan. We were able to do it without talking about American politics, uh, which is a good thing because it is far too serious a business uh, for all of us. I, I wish you all a great weekend. Um, for to the extent we can, given the circumstances that we have just been discussing. Uh, and for all of you uh, watching, uh, tune in again next week uh, for another round of World Review. Thank you all. Bye-bye.